on you. my property. You didn't win shit in my yard. Wait, wait, wait. I, all of you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Jared Mount. So we are here at the, what, four state river panel seminar shindig. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Yeah. A, a lot of good information in here right now. now. Absolutely. And for everyone, you know, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas. We wanted to put something on that was just kind of in between this law between Thanksgiving and Christmas time for all the people that just want to get away from their families and actually talk about the things that matter, such as fishing and hunting. And we have a great lineup here for you today. Did you want to like, kind of tell everyone that's watching who we got yeah we got three river guides um and you know i'm gonna say that these three guys fish by far more than anybody in this room i know we got a lot of river rats in here that fish a lot but you combine the number of hours and days these guys are on the river uh it's it's going to be astronomical uh we've got three different guys we've got chris gorsuch uh, with real river adventures out of susquehanna river we got jeff green with shallow water fishing adventures uh, mainly on the upper potomac and then travis edens with kingfisher guide service uh guiding on the Shenandoah River. Um, so it's, it's going to be a good seminar opportunity for our live guests to ask questions and also online guests. To ask questions. 100%. And then it, a link in the episode description is to all three guide services, their websites, Instagram, Facebook, everything is there. So if you would like to book a trip with them, please feel free to go through there and you can go that way. I will be monitoring the comment section down below. So if you have a question you'd like to ask them, ask away. Um, and then we're going to be getting going here in a minute, right? All right. Good deal. So we're going to go and get started. Uh, we're going to go down the line here. I want you to introduce yourself and what body of water you're fishing predominantly and or all the waters you're fishing and maybe the boat that you're fishing out of. Once we finish introductions, we'll start taking your questions. All right. Um, my name is Jeff Green. I own and operate Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. Um, I uh, guide on the Upper Potomac River and the uh, Susquehanna River. I also own and operate um, SWFA Baits, which is an online uh, tackle shop. Um, I operate the guide service with a uh, Sea Arc jet boat. Uh, it's a 60-40, uh, and uh, it's about 17 feet long. So that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Travis Edens, and I'm the uh, owner and operator of Kingfisher Guide Services. Um, I float and fish mostly the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac, especially around Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. And I use a uh, 14 foot whitewater raft. Uh, it's decked out with a frame that I row. So it's a little different from these guys to you know, get around on the river and stuff, but uh, it does the job. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Gorsuch. I own and operate Real River Ventures, and 99% of my fishing is the Juniata, the Susquehanna Main Stem near Harrisburg, and the North Branch up pretty close to the New York border. So, and we run, because it's full time, I have two 20 foot jet boats. So if one's not working, then I can go back home and put that on the table. <laughs> it's one of those things I've learned over 16 years, you almost have to have a backup. So that's really, I'm very happy to be here. Susquehanna this time of year, we fish it in the summer and all, and we read a lot about the cold water fishing, but just for, you want to get out there, you just want to try to put some fish in a boat, what would be like your top three lures that you would just say that if you could have nothing else with you that day, what would what would you go with just to start out with and then say that didn't work? What would how would you progressively go through that? Okay, it's a great question. The question was you're heading out into the Susquehanna and I'm gonna say wintertime fishing, right? Even Correct. technically right now we're mm -hmm. not in winter yet. Uh, yeah. It certainly feels like it, right? <laughs> um, my three lures. You, you have to have some kind of a jig that you're really familiar with, right? You have to have confidence. So your favorite jig, and I, I'm going to say a two would be my number one thing that I go with. Um, I have a lot of confidence in it. It looks like a lot of the crayfish. Um, I'll be honest with you. It's called a number of different things. But if you have a green pumpkin with black and purple fleck on it, it's going to be, you know, pretty much the, the go-to. You're going to vary. That lure works in every color. But if it's really clear, it's not too dark to work, and it's not, it matches everything that's on the bottom. Uh, you'll hear me in my things. I, I was never really a big fan of these chili willies, you know, just because it looks so much like uh, 
an eerie daughter that I used when I was a kid and trying to progress and become, if you can have, use the word, more sexy with my lures. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to <laughs> use that silly lure, right? So, but I can tell you and those who have been in this in this room of fish with me in cold water, it's just one of those baits you have to have. I have a great, great confidence in it. I prefer the laminate colors. So, you know, if it's really dark, bumblebee. If it's a little bit, you know, stained, I, I like the black and tan. And then you can go on. They have a whole bunch, like a blue belly one that I don't even know what they call it anymore. I should go back. But that's one of those. And they have special hooks for them, but on a net rig, that's just dynamite. And right now, if you're going to be looking to find fish, I really think uh, a jerk bait's your number one bet. And I don't, you know, to me, it varies day to day. It really does. I just, as long as it suspends successfully at whatever level it's supposed to, and you kind of know where you're throwing to. Um, I, you know, so one day I'll be throwing mega bass the next day, lucky craft, you know, I don't mind the X wraps, but I tend to go smaller, the colder the water gets. I was going to ask about size wise, when you're starting it, what would you start with, with your initial size? And then do you go up, down, or as just as a general rule? Then? Size for jerk baits. So I like to throw a big jerk bait. I like, you know, 115s, 117s, 112s, 110s, but I nearly got my butt handed to me on Tuesday, or I guess it was Wednesday this week, throwing a bigger bait. And I was confident the fish were here, were there. I couldn't tell if I was getting ticked or bumped by fish uh, because of the wind, but something didn't feel right. And I, I switched up to a smaller version in the exact same color and went six fish in a row. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you it, it's knowing when to go to that. And this temperature was 42 degrees a week ago. It's 36 now. And this was 36 on Wednesday when I was out. And I should have known better. But, you know, mistakes are made. <laughs> hey, Chris, following up on, on, on those questions. Um, when the water is really, really, really clear, jerk bait still? You still throw a jerk bait? Yes. So the question is, what do we do when the water is gin clear? Gin clear. Yeah. So gin clear is the toughest situation you're going to run into. Um, I don't move the bait a lot. My jerks are, are really, they're just twitches. And it's very, very slow. And I prefer translucent color baits. So less bright, you know, something you can almost see through, more muted colors. Uh, I know Floyd's a big fan. I'll tell Floyd some sort of secret here. Floyd loves matte colored baits, you know, so, or at least he did. I don't know if he still does, but he's a big matte bait fan. But do you have anything, anything you want to add to that as far as uh, I mean, No, I mean, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah, so. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the question was about the uh, jerk baits. The, uh, the ones that I like to use is uh, what he just mentioned, the Lucky Craft ones, the uh, Mega Bass. I use that, was it the 110 Junior? Mm -hmm. I like that one. I like, in the Lucky Craft, I like three different sizes. Um, the 100, the 78, and then like he's talking about when it gets real cold, that's 65. And um, you, know, you want it to just hover right over the top of those rocks. Same thing for all of you, because I'm sure you all got vast knowledge. This That same time of year, we're talking winter. You start out, are you trying to find current? Are you trying to find still less moving water you're trying to find a break between faster moving water and still just like i said this is in general i know everything condition change but you're out there your first time at it your best chance to take a stab and getting on some fish you know one or two would be great just so you put you know a couple in the boat what would you do as a rule of thumb like you're seeing it and it's just the river's not raging it's not super low just call it normal conditions what would you start out as depth wise current wise what type of water would you go to first that time of year cold water in cold water like right now cold november, water right yeah, december. november december moving into the uh, when you get in there yeah, and then you're talking degrees. about like what are we talking 40 degrees. 40 degrees 40 degrees 40 degree water it depends on how high the water is the fish operate completely on the water level 100 percent. and um and then your clarity but like for instance on the upper potomac river right now if there's areas of the river that that are flowing real slow and um, it's uh, super clear. Uh, they're in the middle of the river. They're under rocks. Right. And they have to be actually out from under these rocks to even see your bait. But when, when they are, um, 
you're fishing in current. I mean, I've caught fish recently in 39 degrees and the water's moving real slow. And uh, I'm using, you know, I was using pointer 78s. To, you're just slow jerk. You're just yeah, just a long slide like Chris, just twitch. Like he mentioned, yeah. Just very, just just a slow twitch, and then you you twitch it one time and just let it let it float. So you let it pause, you twitch it, then let it what, drift a couple of feet or something. I'm talking like fifteen, you get 15, 30 seconds. Just let it sit there okay. and just drift, and it, so it, it just does this in the for current. You at that point, when it's just yeah, and then all of a sudden you'll feel a tap, usually. So they're just seeing it as it's drifting within that current, mm -hmm. and you don't have to add any extra to it. Just let no. it don't overwork the bait. Let it do it. Oh, yeah, definitely not. Oh, don't overwork the bait. Yeah, they they eat it on the pause. Really. Yeah. Yeah, but the uh the current um you would think that they'd go into an eddy somewhere well, and hold, hold up in forty degree water. Right. Do you think they'd get but to they the won't. side and it'll be like it's warmer over here, but it not depends on the water side. level. Yeah. Well you can go into a section of the river that's shaded when it's cold and they're in there, but they're not over on the other side of the river where it's warm. The jerk bait seems to work, but like he said, the the uh the tube, you can't beat a tube even in those conditions. Those conditions that you mentioned, the low, clear, uh -huh. cold, those are uh, those are tough conditions. The tube, the same thing. You're crawling it and just letting it drift with the current. Yeah. Will you have enough weight of the tube? Would it sit still? Or do you want the current actually pushing it you want along? It, you want it to sit still. So the weight of the yeah. bait, when it's on the – when you cast that out, you let the weight of the bait get you to the bottom. You don't want the current to move it. You want it to no, sit there. Yeah, you then you're you moving it. Well, yep. the amount you want to move yeah. and let you, there you're reacting more with the other, the uh, jerk bait. It's more the baits action, the, the tube or whatever you're imparting the action Yeah, and let it just sit and it, you just drag yeah, it along yeah. slowly. La just last week I was out uh, on the Shenandoah and the water was low before the rain, uh, crystal clear. And, you know, I pulled one citation fish out of a very shallow, relatively shallow spot. You can almost see the bottom. Um, and it was on a tube and as it gets colder with the tubes, I, I don't know about these guys, but I downsize, I go to a smaller tube, you know, like a two inch. Yeah. So it's two inch a good, say when you're saying small is a like two inch, you go smaller than that sometimes there's a like two is about two, two to two and three quarters, you know, right. In that um, range when you're, yeah, in that range, uh, and just let it, like I said, you know, let it sit again, you know, with the. You know, similar to fishing jerk baits and stuff like that. You know, you want, to, you want to let it sit and marinate. You know, it's cold water fishing, man. Those fish are, <laughs> yeah, those those fish are 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 slow to move, uh, but they're not going to pass up. So you know, you're going to be in in general. Again, I know we're talking general terms. More of a tick than a thump when the oh, fish is going to strike. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had it. I've had thumps. I mean, right. But just as a general <laughs> rule, you would feel more of a subtle. Tick. Uh, yes, one can get crazy on it. So fishing every day, I can tell you there is no one answer to this. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So <laughs> I will tell you this: faster and more current than you can fathom. There, there are I'm, a lot more current. I mean, I'm, I fished. I'm gonna. I don't mean to just to give. I fished with two other guides uh, on a on a, a video that we shot many years ago, and uh, it was with. Uh, up on the Juniata, and uh, it was in my boat, so I got to pick the places we went. And uh, both of the, the guides, after I was done, said, I would have never fished this fast of water this time of year. And so you do have those days when you want to be in absolute, the deadest water you can find. You don't want to move the bait much. You want to be checking your line once in a while more than bouncing it. Right. And then it could be the exact same water temperature, you know, 34, 35, 36, you can mention 40. 40, you can get away with almost anything. But when you drop below 37 degrees, you really have to be a little bit more in tune. But, you know, you have to, two guys fishing, you want to communicate with each other. Hey, I just felt a pickup. I wasn't moving the bait. Or, hey, I noticed my line moving and then I set the hook. Or that fish almost ripped the rod out of my hand, right? So it's, there's... You want to try it all, right. and I would say start out in that dead, dead water, but don't be afraid to throw into the current seam and let it bounce into that dead water because sometimes they're sitting. I mean, it takes almost as much effort for these fish to be in light current 
than it does to be in no current because they, they can't kind of control their body, mm -hmm. right? So unless they're laying on the bottom or laying under a rock, which they do, <laughs> you'll see them. Um, but a lot of times they like to be on that soft seam. And then one thing I'll just add one thing really quick is everybody likes to fish below a ledge, right? They like to cast up to a fish below and, and of course there's fish there. But a lot of times due to the hydraulics, mm -hmm. when the water is at, these normalized levels, they'll be four feet in front of the ledge in that pillow of very close, soft close, water. Close water. And if you've yeah. ever waded or these raft guys know, right? You 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 can you can be in those areas and not hit the rock, but not not go up river either, right? You're just there's there's a real soft cushion in front of these underwater flows right so just knowing that and feeling that with your jerk bait or feeling it with your tube sometimes those fish are in that pillow and you hit that pillow it's a it's a gold mine it's your question right here doc yep. yeah just kind of go with all three of y'all so you're wondering what do you find as far as line that you can use you know especially bottom fishing you know whether it be braid the fluoro leader or fluoro or mono what what, uh, uh, what kind of line to use i'm a, I'm a big fan of braid because braid does not, it's uh, static and not dynamic, so it doesn't stretch uh, with, you know, this time of the year, if it's clear water, you know, I'll, I'll throw on a, a, a fluorocarbon leader, but uh, me personally use 10-pound uh, test. Um, I like to use, uh, you said in the cold water, what kind of line? Yeah, I like to use fluorocarbon to a uh, braided, uh, you know, to braided line. Um, and to tell you the, the type of line I like to use is, um, is either, uh, uh, sunline. There's a, there's a, it's a certain model of sunline. It's called sniper, but it's not, there's other sniper, but there's this one that I really like and that they played off like it's camo, but that's not the reason why I use it. It just happens to look like that, but the, that line seems to work really well. And I like to use anything between eight and 10 pounds. Most of the time I use eight though. And, um, I tie it with a double uni knot. And I um, and I can just tie what is it called a, a cinch knot instead of using a Palomar knot on this type of line. But uh, to answer, also to um, let you know, fluorocarbon. In my experience, you get what you pay for with fluorocarbon. If you buy cheap fluorocarbon, you're going to get cheap results. They're going to bust that line. Um, and uh, you know, I, I also use uh, depending on like um, the jerk baits he was talking about earlier. I like to use monofilament. Because it floats, the jerk bait. Also, you want to have it suspend. That's my idea. That's what I believe. And um, and I always use for all of these um, uh, leaders. I use about a rod's length of uh, leader line. So if you have a seven foot rod, use roughly seven feet of uh, leader line. So and then uh, the monofilament. If you're using like a uh, jerk bait, it stretches. It's, you know, you, you, it, it's so when that fish hits it, you pull back on it. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a of give, and you're not going to rip those treble hooks out of his mouth. For jerk baits, you're going to have your schools of old school guys who like like to use motto like me, <laughs> and then you'll have the uh, the guys who want to use a sinking line because they want to get down for it and what their bait is is listed for because that line's going to sink. And then you have the guys who want to use you know they want to feel everything about that bait, so they're going to throw on uh, eight, ten, or twelve pound super line you know your braid onto a longer leader and so it all works the biggest key is knowing where your bait is in that mm -hmm. water line. so if if you're new to it pick one and go with it right and so learn. if you have a big hook set i'm going to tell you to stay away from those from that that super line because <laughs> or go to a really soft really slow rod because you're going to rip the hooks out of their mouth you just will um the key is I can make a bait go deeper or low or by the by the width of the line, <laughs> by the type of the line. So as long as you know where your fishing column is, because I've had days where fishing the exact same bait on two different lines created two different results. So if as long as you there's days when you can't get that 100 down deep enough, standard SP 100 down deep enough without going to some kind of either fluorocarbon or going to a super line with the fluorocarbon leader. But I prefer to throw a deeper lip and be down there with my model because I tend to sit the hook really hard, right? I just can't help myself, right? <laughs> and then as far as knots, one that you tie and you're comfortable with, 
right? Mm -hmm. So you have direct access to most of these line manufacturers. If you're having a problem with a knot, they may tell you to use a different line when you're tying it to it. If you don't moisten the Palomar knot, it is going to break mm -hmm. on a hook set, on floor part. It just will. Moist. Because when it heats up, it gets weak. I use fluorocarbon because it's super abrasive resistance. I don't use it for its visibility. It sinks well, and it's really abrasive resistance. So you, that in combination with uh, super line, I think a break on a jig, I mean, you can feel that fish go by. So we're going to break into some online questions here, here now for everyone. This first one is from, and I apologize, I'm not good at the old English, whooping bass. Whoop bass, whoop bass for ten dollars. He asked this question for Chris: What is the best depth for winter holes, and what bottom structure defines a wintering hole? Uh, this is only two hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> for the Susquehanna, this has kind of changed stuff, and this is not a bash on the flatheads, but a lot of the community holes that were once seven to twelve foot deep, around right about now, are starting to really house hundreds if not more of the flathead and the channel cats more than they've ever housed before and i can tell you from fishing the delaware and the hudson where we have these shad runs and the striper runs smallmouth don't play well with big groups of fish even if they're not predatory but if you fish the delaware during the main shad run and try to catch bass good luck to you because they don't like thousands of fish or hundreds of fish swimming by them they just don't they're they're Although they're they're they, they're schooling fish themselves, they really don't like being in those pockets. So, if you used to fish 400 in 10 foot of water with the other 10 to 20 boats and catch 70 to 80 bass, those days are gone, right? So now I'm instead of hitting four or five spots in the winter, I'm hitting 30 or 40. And if you fish with me, you know we, I'm going to run. That's why I've got the faster boat now because I want to be able to run to these spots. And some days it's going to be three and a half to five foot behind a grass bed. And some days it's going to be three to five foot in front of a, you know, in front of a, or behind a rock ledge. Um, I'm constantly looking and they will move. I mean, it's amazing that, that they'll move. So you'll have bottoms of islands, sides of islands that are shaped right, rock ledges, you know, um, and grass beds are really your primary piece. I think when it gets really cold, there's four or five places that always hold fish and then you have to look for them otherwise but my best hole you know eight years ago you could sit and catch 40 bass out of one hole now if i can get 15 out of a hole i'm, I'm doing really well so i prefer gravel structure but i'm not going to argue with fish that want to be in mud and i'm going to check them i'll do i'll do my grass bed thing first or my my ledges first and if i can't find them i'm going to go to mud i'm going to go to softer bottoms and the question was about wintering holes and uh, what was it here? Depth. Depth and, uh, so um, on the uh, Potomac River, uh, I believe they like anything that's uh, four feet or deeper. And then and then on the Potomac River, it depends on the clarity. If the water's super clear, they're not going to be sitting in those spots. They'll be out in the middle of the river if the water's low enough. But um, and on the uh, uh, the Susquehanna where I guide, um, uh, they tend to be. You can find them even in uh, shallower water sometimes, but they're about the same. But I can tell you this about the smallmouth on the Potomac River. They move constantly. When I tell you they move, they move all the time. You can hit a section of river one day and you'll go back to it and they're nowhere to be found. They just, they just, they move. They move from one section to another. And um, I've noticed that this, this year I've really noticed you'll fish in an area and if it's almost like they're doing a big circle constantly. You won't catch them in a spot that you caught them yesterday, but if you uh, you hit it early in the morning and go back a couple hours later, there'll be three fish there, and it's it's like they they just go back, go around and around and around, and um, that's my experience with it with uh, you know the the different depths and um, where they sit during cold water, you know uh, situations. Yeah, as far as. Uh... <clears throat> What I've seen on the Shenandoah and the Potomac around Harpers Ferry is that, um, you know, generally what I'll focus on is, uh, is deep holes to start out with uh, if I've got if, if they're there. Um, but I also find that at low clear water, they 
the fish move around. And I think that they move from one hole to another. Uh, you just kind of seeing what's out there. Uh, but, you know, as far as bottom, you start feeling chunk, you know, big rocks and stuff like that. You know, there's a pretty good bet you're going to get into them. Close upper tumble in the Shenandoah by the crow flies. What's the difference between the two areas in your, you know, that you see between upper Potomac, upper Harpers Ferry, and down? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the difference between the upper Potomac around Harpers Ferry and, sh and the Shenandoah is that, well, for one, the Potomac uh, is much wider than what the Shenandoah is. Uh, <clears throat> plus, I find that uh, you've got a little bit more, the Shenandoah tend to concentrate a little bit more on the, on the banks. Fishing the banks, but of course, you know, it's like, like, uh, Jeff said here, you know, I mean, it's it, water level dictates it where these fish are. And, um, uh, but it, you know, really the big difference between the two is that, uh, you know, Potomac's much water seems to have a little bit more, um, uh, you know, rock structure, you know, uh, solid bedrock. I mean, don't get me wrong, Shenandoah does as well, but, uh, you know, it seems to be a little bit more, um, uh, prevalent and uh, you know between the two whereas you get down on the south fork you get a lot of cobble uh you know on the south fork so we'll question, uh, online questions. yeah we got a couple of online questions here we go to and again for everyone like listening in right now we're at nine likes if we could get that up to 15 likes that'd be awesome and again if you want to ask a question online you can go for it. Any super chat question automatically enters you in for a raffle at the end of the day. And it will also make sure that your question gets answered first. The next question we have is from Sam. Oh God. Sam Idigan. Sam Idigan, I think. How sorry, bud. How does a high water event like we are seeing right now affect winter river fishing? All right. How does a high water event like now? Uh you know, so the way it will affect winter fishing is. Uh, you know, I found, Jeff and I were talking about this early in 2018, we had tons and tons of water. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, if you didn't learn to figure out where the fish were in 2018, you probably didn't find much of the fish. Uh, but uh, it, it taught me personally, it taught me a lot about uh, where to go. You know, when the water comes up, it gets dirty. Uh, you know, as far as on the Shenandoah, uh, you know, you find them up on the, in a lot of the bank eddies and we're talking, you know, so if the Shenandoah, the Millville gauge at, uh, for the Shenandoah is running at, you know, seven feet, uh, you just concentrate on those bank eddies a lot of times because there's, there is structure out in the middle of, of the river and they could definitely be down on the bottom at it, but a lot of times when it's dirty. I think they move up to those bank eddies and some of those bank eddies would, would be two feet wide and you could pull a citation fish out of that, you know, two feet wide, uh, water, uh, tough thing is, is keeping your bait in there, uh, you know, such a small area and not running right up on top of it. But, uh, you know, it's definitely, um, uh, you know, higher water is a challenge. And like anything, you adapt and you overcome. And, uh, you know, on a high water day, I mean, if you come out with a handful of fish, I mean, I think you've done good. So better than getting skunked. <laughs> so to be clear about high water, there's two different pieces of high water. Yeah. There is the rise and the fall. So if you can be out there on the rise, don't miss that opportunity. Yeah. It, it, when they're moving, you know, if you can be out there before it crests, when they're when they're moving to those places, even though turbidity can be a problem, but you're using that at max turbidity. And when I'm talking about turbidity, is the best location might be on the bank, but it's full of garbage and debris. But in the middle of the river, behind an island where the debris isn't that bad, that might be a place that you try to hit them. At. So bass are just like any other living creature, right? As soon as the as soon as that flow increases, as soon as the air increases for a deer, you're going to go to some place where you're protected, right? And if they have protection and food, that's all the better. So they're going to move tight. So, you know, that state, statement where, you know, 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water, high water, 99% of the fish are in 10% of the water. So you, if for me, it's a little easier to find them. Now, once that water is crested, and it starts to go down, that's a whole different ball of wax there. You have to cover yourself, look for a lot of other places, 
And those are the days when you walk out of there with just a handful of fish because they, when it's going up, they're going to go to the best spots and you, you're going to find those best spots are going to be loaded with fish. As it goes down, they're going to drip down to those pockets and then do what Jeff said. They're going to start to do their circling pattern and move around these bigger eddies. So as that water level starts to drop, even though it's still high water, they can be really tricky to find, right? But cold water on a high water event, it, it pushes these fish to where it is. I'll tell you one thing too is sun is your friend only during the winter. So if you've got a sunny bank in the afternoon, I would spend most of my time on that sunny bank in the shadows. Because I mean, at this time of year, one of my favorite places to fish doesn't even get sunshine until three o'clock, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. So I kind of avoid it come February. Right? But that's one of my favorite places to fish in the summer, even though it has you know, the sun comes on at nine o'clock or ten o'clock. If you if you've got those spots that are sunny and you've got turbidity in the water, the way that that water will warm up so much faster on a than on a clear day is just amazing. And I'll add to it that uh, sometimes just a couple degrees Ooh. in water temp rise can turn the bite on. So, um, my experience on the uh, Upper Potomac River and the uh, mainly the Upper Potomac River is like right now the gauge at um, Edwards Ferry is reading like eight four. It's starting to crest, so that means the water at uh, the Point of Rocks gauge. People are familiar with that is probably around four. They're, they're about two uh two feet apart always every now and then you'll come across an instance where one where, where they're not that way and you have to be real careful depending on the water level but um my experience on the uh, potomac is um like right now they push up on the shorelines and they push up on them real tight and uh you just have to keep finding areas uh where there's uh just pools of water and they'll sit in a um an eddy where it looks like the water's only like uh I don't know two feet wide and there's no no water moving and there could be five fish sitting right there it could be a giant sitting in there with with some other fish so um what else the uh i was thinking i was thinking about something and i lost my train of thought on it what'd you say <laughs> yeah well i just turned 44 so it's all downhill um but they um uh, you know, uh, he was saying too, even in high water, I believe that these fit now that these are just my, you know, my beliefs, these fish, there's fish in the middle of the river, even when the water's super high. And I think they're behind rocks. They're behind, they're in places where you can't even fish for them. I mean, the water's just rolling and, um, they tuck up under rocks and, uh, and those fish are probably uncatchable at that moment in time, you know, but I do find that the best time to catch them in the winter time is when the water's rising. Um, I have found though that when the water's real high, like right now, it's just up. It's not super high, but it's it's tough to catch them um, in the winter time uh, when it's when it's super high. Uh, especially if you try to use the same idea of like when it's uh, spring, summer, or fall, where you can go up into the creeks and catch them. They don't ever tend to be in the creeks. You guys ever find that? No, because of water volume, right? So yeah. I'm going to talk loud just so you guys can hear me. Water volume is a huge, huge piece. So in the, in the wintertime, at a 10 degree night or a 20 degree night, those smaller flows of those creeks are going to be dumping the coldest water in the river in the morning. So I know guys like to fish below a creek, but in the wintertime, that's not your best bet unless there's a warm water influence. So generally speaking, the smaller fishing the mouths of a creek on a high rise in the winter, not your cup of tea, unless you get like a 50 degree rain, then it changes it. But you know, the most of us river guys, we don't have to have the most expensive electronics, right? But if you can just tell you tell what the water temperature is, even if it's not exact, right? Mm -hmm. So I might be reading 35.6 and Jeff might be reading 37, but we know where our baseline is, right? So. If we find a spot that's 40, I'm probably going to spend more time at 40 than I am at 37 if I have the option. I just believe that it happens. And someone mentioned it out here. As the water changes, you get a two or three degree rise on a sunny day. That's going to really impact these fish. It just will. And you'll find them shallow. Speaking of electronics, in the winter, I would imagine, would side scan be of help in some of those holes? 
It can't, it can't hurt. You use it? I don't. I don't. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, you've got 360 and mega views and live scope and all these wonderful tools. Um, they're all helpful, right? You still have to find active fish. Just because you find fish right. sitting someplace doesn't mean they're active, but it shortens the game, you know? And if there, if there is a time of the year to waste your time using that on the river, uh, that would be the time, right? That's a great question. You mean during the winter time? Uh, we'll go winter. But... Okay, well, I think winter they move less, right? Because they have less, they have, they, have to, they have to be very conscious of how much they burn, right? So when Jeff's saying they move in a circle, you know, back in the 400 days, you could watch people catch fish, and then four boats later, they're catching fish, and down the line, you could see them swinging and doing that circle. So they're definitely moving. It depends on the size of the hole. I don't think these fish are moving eight miles in the course of two days in the wintertime. I think if they're, they'll slide up along an island, they'll slide along a ledge. I mean, if you follow their seasonal movement, which I really try to, I really try to, to pinpoint that seasonal movement, where I'll follow, follow the same group of fish, eight miles up the river. I, I love doing that because I kind of know I'm going to be on fish right from the word go. Getting this, timing this winter move is really tough. I mean, I don't think these fish locally moved into their winter patterns until this week or last week. I mean, they were, I found fish in summer patterns, fish in fall patterns, fish, and I think they're just now starting to gather up. Mm -hmm. We're like last year, they were gathered up already by now. So depends on the flow. Uh, if there's food and shelter, I, I think they don't move very much at all. If there's not, I think they move a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they may go further. A study was done, Berkeley did a study, I think it was on the uh, upper Mississippi, and they 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 track fish moving 12 miles during the spring migration. I'm not saying they all do, but in my river, in my river system, the bigger the creek, the bigger the migration. So, you know, if you look at the, at the, it's too bad that dam's there, but if the west branch and north branch didn't have a dam in front of it, you'd see a huge migration up those rivers. <coughs> right now, the bigger the creeks, the bigger, the bigger that migration is. To online, let's see. The next question you had was from uh, Brandon Solis. How have the flat, oh gosh, yeah. How have the flathead affected no. smallmouth in the winter? <laughs> How have the flathead affected smallmouth in the winter? <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, so I, I used to be an absolute frothing from the mouth hater when it came to talking about flatheads. Just they annoyed me. The guys who stocked them annoyed me. Um, but my position has changed over the years. I'm still not happy about it. Um, but it has really improved my own personal fishing game. It, it has. Uh, the ability to go out and find fish easily has been taken away, but you're now looking more, now trying different baits. You're now, you know, using, you know, you used to go out with a, a smoke purple tube and you could catch 50 fish without even thinking about it in these holes. Now you've really got out your brain. You're, you're going to be playing with, you know, better lures, so something they haven't seen before, you're gonna try a different technique, you're gonna look in different areas, you're burning more fuel, which is probably good for the economy, but, you know. but you, you, it, 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 it has changed the game where a lot of these known community holes are still holding bass, but only a fraction of what they used to hold. And so these bass have found other areas, what we've talked about, you know, what we've looked for them, and, and that's where it's changed. Do they, Prey on smallmouth, absolutely. But I'm sure the prey, the smallmouth prey on the smaller ones of those as they're born. So it's it's just it's it's a good way of maintaining the population. I know that's not popular. I think that it's going to improve our size over time because there's fewer fish to eat, even though the the, the flatheads eat a lot themselves. I just think it, it has changed the location more than anything else. It's a soft 40 degree weather. I, I, a little bit, limited. Uh, Grinding I'm a, the bottom. I'm sorry. Grinding the bottom? Yes. It's slow. As slow as you can go. Right. 
crankbait. No. Crankbait's the only time. So I love crankbaits. And Floyd knows I love them. But uh, Floyd schooled me on a 37 degree day. We had to be in seven or eight foot of water. And he just drugged that bottom. I mean, I think that he had to have a, a mud line behind that bait. And he was catching fish. And I just was blown away. But no, that's not my. I've seen it work. And even though I've seen it work, I'm apt to throw a jerk bait or a tube or something like that. That's one bait. Floyd definitely schooled me on that. Thomas? Um, again, this one is from Brandon. Weirdest thing that happened to you guys on the water this year <laughs> that you can talk about. Oh, I can't It was about, I don't know, two weeks ago. It was a nice fall evening. No, I was, I was going up the river. It was in between uh, White's Ferry and um, Dickerson, the Dickerson power plant. And I got a guy with me. I look over to the, on the Virginia side and there's a dude swimming in the water. Water was like 42 degrees. At first I thought he didn't have any clothes on, but um, he had, um, I guess there, I guess there were swim trunks. I mean, I look over and the guy's swimming in the water and it's 42 degrees. So that's the weirdest thing I've seen uh, that, that, that I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I've seen some uh, other things, but we won't get into that. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of weird things that have happened to me, but I will say there was one instance uh, this past, uh, I guess it was early, late October, early November, and uh, I did watch a guy with a new boat, new to him boat, uh, put it on the river. Obviously, had not uh, done any figuring out how to make the motor run or anything like that, checking his, you know, trolling motor batteries or anything like that. And he launched and, uh, you know, was floating down the river and uh, was trying to start his motor and, and stuff. And I actually went over, rode over with him with my customers and uh, tried to school the guy a little bit on what he needed to do and that he needed to drop an anchor because he was about to the point of no return. So, so I had another one. This is Montgomery County, Maryland now at Edwards Ferry. I pull up to come, um, you know, to, to uh, finish the day off. And um, there was a couple of people that had decided on the boat ramp to set a table up on the boat ramp and they were eating lunch on the boat ramp. I mean, who knew? I mean, they were eating lunch on the boat ramp. I, I don't know, man. Chris doesn't want to comment. I think the Maryland people are crazy. Yeah. 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 Uh, you talked about the fish that just will be stubborn and not be able to see your bait. Do you have a preferred, every brand has their own stench to it. Do you have a preferred stench that you like? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That more yeah, I'll say is, you know, as far as um, you're talking about like, uh, Travis, you know, repeat the question. Yeah. You, so you're looking for, the question is, is that a, uh, a smell for the bait? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you know, I like um, that dip and glow, uh, that scented dip and glow, and I'll take a tube and um, take the uh, legs of it and dip it in orange dip and glow. There's a certain time of the year that you know crayfish will have a little bit of, uh, at least the local crayfish will have a little bit of uh, orange on them, and uh, you know, it makes your boat smell like uh, an Italian restaurant. So. <laughs> So hopefully Stan from Pit Lures is not watching this now. Uh, we always have this conversation because I call it a scent and he calls it a taste. And I think that what his point is, is that bass don't have a sensory like a salmon does or a catfish. The key to using them, and I like bass fees from Smelly Jelly. Mm -hmm. just, and I like the stuff that comes in a paste because it's less of a mess. Um, but if you open it up in the summertime, you're going to kill somebody. So I only ever use mine. But what it does is it'll, it gets that fish to hold on to it a second longer so that, you know, because they're, you know, they're not crushing it and ripping the rod out of your hand. Sometimes it's just a little tap, a little tick. It feels like someone's just flicking the bait like that. And what you'll feel sometimes, you feel them spitting it out, rejecting it. And you go to set the hook and you come up empty. So 
with the attractant on it, I'm going to say for flavor, I think that they hit it. And if they hit it, they'll hit it again, or they'll hold on to it a little bit longer so you can feel it. But, you know, whether you're using a Strike King product or something, I mean, some people like garlic scent. I just usually use a crawfish because I think they, they eat a lot of crawfish and they like it. But I'll even paste, if I'm throwing blade baits or a jerk bait and it bites real slow, I'll even dip my finger in it and, mm. and coat the bait so that if they hit it to see if it's real or not, and they get that whiff of it or that flavor, they'll come back and grab it. I don't know if it works, but it gives me confidence, which makes me fish the bait longer. And I might be successful just because of confidence. You lick your finger out? <laughs> you lick your finger out? Oh, absolutely. Yes. This stuff tastes <laughs> nasty. I use um, I use a smelly jelly. I use it. It's in a it's in a, a plastic jar. Um, I use the orange. I guess it's a crawdad flavor, and uh, I, I feel like they. Um, it just gives you a little something extra. I only use it in the wintertime, like like he was just talking about. Uh, they'll come up to it. I, I think sometimes that's the deal breaker. I think they swim up to it. You know, they're they're looking at it. They're like, man, I don't know. Um, it doesn't really look like something I want to eat, but maybe. I mean, I know they're fish, but, you know, they're just sitting there. I think it just gives them a little something extra, and they grab it. And uh, that's when you have time to set the hook on them. Or like, he, like uh, Chris said, they just hold on to it for that just – that tiny bit much longer and uh you fool them and then that's how you can uh you know land a big one that way too Thomas? all right we got a we got another question online here it is from we're gonna call him larry okay, larry h7237 how much does the full moon affect them i'm assuming he's talking about smallmouth uh, i'll say i'll say as far as the full moon uh especially in the summertime it will affect them uh full moon will walk. i mean they'll feed through the night mm -hmm. on a full moon and you come back the next morning and you know they're just not hungry you know <laughs> there's fewer of yeah. them you know to, that are hungry so because they fill their bellies through the night yeah when i started guiding full-time i stopped looking at moon phases i stopped looking at um, anything that would detract me from having a negative attitude going out very good. Um, Joe Raymond and I, and who doesn't mind me telling this, we fished a morning of a super moon <laughs> and we struggled to find fish. And this is we, two people who knew an area very well struggled to find fish. Um, it's one of those days where I think on that situation, if you can select the afternoon or evening to fish, that's a better time to fish you know, as it comes into the evening in the, in the summertime. I don't think it plays as much of a role in the wintertime. But in the summertime, those long days, super moon. I mean, I used to remember almost getting up in the morning and seeing the, the moon up in the, you know, bright full moon up in the sky going, I'm not going out for this guy. Just not going to do it. But like I said, I don't, you can catch fish somewhere. Somebody's catching mm -hmm. fish. So if I go out, if I look at the, the, the tide tables or if I'm looking at something, you know, I, I just put it out of my head. I don't want to go out there and not think I'm not going to catch it. So my even if I have a poor day, I'll tell my clients somebody somewhere is catching these fish. You just picked the wrong guy that day. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't figure them out. But there is a there is there there is very few days, and there are days when the fish will not eat, and I find them to be very close to super. Fun. This time of year, do you prefer a uh, steady barometric pressure falling or rising? This time of year. Wow, uh, this time of the year, steady or falling. So, yeah, you guys, the same thing. And this is to add what uh, Chris was saying. So, w w when you fish a bunch and you fish every day, none of those things um, should let you or should change your mind about fishing. You should always have some type of positive outlook on it because the uh, fact is, the more you fish, uh, the more chances you have of uh, having a bad day fishing, if that's such a thing, right? I mean, um, they're going to go out there and it doesn't matter what you do. It's just not happening, you know? And I, I guess it depends on the fishery. Like the uh, Potomac river can be a lot more finicky than the, uh, the Susquehanna river. Yeah, for someone who, uh, I'm a bank eater. I love dirty water. And currently right now, I mean, it's, it's gin clear, beautiful water. For someone who lacks confidence in, you know, clear water, 
Do you have any tips or suggestions um, for fishing in that? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> what time of year did you say? Preferably any, but I guess right now. Since so in the winter time, you're talking about fishing the bank uh, in low clear water. Just well, I best that, that's what I'm comfortable with. You know, dirty bank water in, in general. Um, uh -huh. But obviously, you know, right now it's <laughs> winter time. So this clear water in general, you have any. Yeah, you just have to fish slow, like like they just said. I mean, um, you just have to keep fishing slow and uh, just stay positive about what you're doing because um, you don't want to keep moving around. You want to give these uh, areas that you're, you've been catching fish in a chance because uh, some of those areas will surprise you. Um, and it's usually the ones that uh, you didn't have much confidence in to begin with. I mean, but just slow down fishing and uh, probably uh, – Use a smaller bait, you know, two and three quarter inch tube, something like that, something under three inches. And I'll, I'll add to that, uh, to your question there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll do a little bit of bank fishing. Uh, you know, if I'm on my way to the grocery store or something like that, you know, I need to kill some time, you know, can't take the boat out. I'll go and, and uh, you know, beat the bank. Uh, in winter time, this time of year, you know, I want to look for deep. Uh, generally, and um, fishing slow, so uh, and getting away from the bank. Uh, I did have a, you know, usually what I'll usually what I'll throw is tubes, uh, Ned rigs, things, something, something along those lines. And uh, you know, I had an epiphany with a Ned rig one time uh, in the winter time, low clear water, threw it out there. My normal with the Ned rig was just to hop it every now and again across the bottom and actually rod tip being pulled up. I watched three large mouth and two, very good size large mouth and two small mouth medium size follow the bait. And they, they were interested, but they weren't willing to commit. And they just watched that bait hop across and they follow it. And I thought to myself, all right, you know, I'm watching this all unfold. So let's, let's switch it up a little bit. So I dropped the rod tip and with that Ned rig pulled it. And when I pulled it, it made that Ned rig, it was a two-tone Ned rig, making it spin, so it kind of flashed, and it made them eat. And so from that point on, I was like, all right, I'm going to fish the Ned rig a little bit differently. And being out with a buddy of mine fishing, who's very competent uh, angler, and I was catching fish right in behind him because he was retrieving the Ned rig differently from what I was, and they wanted what I had to offer. We have somebody back here that's running out fishing. Yeah, two of my buddies left the Susquehanna fishing on them. And we always use the bed rig. We want to expand into spinner baits and chatter baits. What's your experience with them? And what color would you use? And how do you fish So the question is a lot of time spent with soft plastics, a variety of soft plastics, and wants uh, advice on whether to throw spinner baits and chatter baits. Yes, you, you definitely want to do that. So um, chatterbaits, when they first came out, um, it was like the whopper flopper of baits, right? I mean, it seemed like every every bass in the river wanted them. Nowadays, they have to throw a little bit more, right? You think you have to throw a little bit. I would recommend finding a competent trailer. A lot of guys use, like to use craw trailers. I would experiment. I like to throw like a razor shad on it. Um, if it's dark, I'll throw dark. If it's clear, I'll throw light. Um, I don't mind it looking like a spinner bait. It doesn't have to look like a crayfish. Uh, you want, it's tough to throw them as a guide, and I'll explain why. Because in a guide, being a guide, you tend to throw towards the structure so it hits right at the grass bed and you bring it, bring it back. So when you do that, you're only covering a piece of where those fish could be. So if you're in a kayak or in a boat fishing by yourself in front of the boat, you can drop down below the island alongside of it and throw that, if this is the island, alongside of it and bring it down that entire side. Mm -hmm. You're going to cover that whole stretch and catch a lot more fish than a guide can because I have to set my boat up like this and both guys have to kind of fight for that territory, right? From the top down, usually bottom up looks a little better which is also more difficult for holding the boat control and giving everybody the good angle. The word angling, you know, when the angle makes a big difference. So uh, yes, 
definitely throw them. And I don't know why, but the jackhammer at the crazy price it is, is a much better bait for me than the other one. I like fishing the Pro Series. I wish it worked as well as a jackhammer, but there's just certain days when that jackhammer is the answer. So the bigger profiles generally work really well. The more grass you have on a grass bed, I kind of like it the better, right? Um, spinnerbaits the same way. You've got someone back here who's making his own spinnerbaits. Generally, when you have that ability to be able to fit, play around with, you know, whether you want Colorado or turtleback or, or willow blades and whether you want uh, two different color combinations on your skirt material, whether you you put a trailer on it or don't put a trailer on it, it's just, it's experimenting. I know that for me, these smaller profile baits work better. And it could be heavy. I, mean, I throw a lot of half ounce, but it's a smaller profile bait. Um, darker water, I'm going to throw a thumper, you know, one big Colorado blade and thump the snot out of that water. It moves really slow. Um, if it's if it's the summertime, I would rather wait till the sun is a little higher in the sky so I get that sun allowing that bait to flash. And um, I'm sometimes fishing current, really, really fast current sometimes with those, with those <coughs> baits. So throw them. You'll have, here's what you got to do, whether you're going to fish either one of these things since you're not used to it, is leave the soft plastics at home, leave them at home so that you'll throw them. And you're going to find that if you don't throw the bait caster right now, because you generally speaking, the smaller soft plastics and spinning bait, spinner, spinning rigs work better. You're going to want to learn to find yourself a good bait caster, and because you're going to be so much more accurate, you're going to have so much more energy at the end of the day. It's not going to beat you up. And you're not going to have to retrieve it super fast to get the move. So that's the advice. But on the Susquehanna, the Delaware, uh, I can speak for the Lower Potomac, spinner baits and chatter baits are. Very good. I like to consider them like they're situational. You can't just always throw them. You have to have the right situation. If you don't have the right situation, they're not going to work. Um, and um, when I say that, like for instance, rising water, spring, summer, fall, not the winter, but spring, summer, fall, you could probably go out there right now and catch one on the spinner bait. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I mean, maybe, but spring, summer, fall, you have rising water, uh, you've got a lot of color to the water. That's when you throw them. Um, if you load clear water, you have to downsize them a lot. Um, believe it or not, when you're talking about a spinner bait, have you guys ever seen a beetle spin? Beetle spins catch big, big, small mouth in the summertime when the water's super, super low. But uh, also, just to add to that real quick, spinner baits and chatter baits, they catch big fish. I know there's other baits that do, but spinner baits and chatter baits catch monster small mouth, absolute giant small mouth. And they're they're definitely worth throwing and and uh, you know getting to know how they work and how to fish them. You can you can um, you can throw it out, pulse it back. You know, um, I don't use a. Uh, he was talking about bait casters. I don't really use bait casters much. In my guide service because most people um, it's it's tough for them. The people I take out. They don't fish all the time, so I use uh, spinning reels. And uh, you want to use like a 2,000 or 2,500 series spinning reel? Yeah, and you, you just pulse them back. But you can also just retrieve them directly back to the boat. But you want to throw it structure. Uh, when I talk about situational too, like I heard him just say, you want to have something to throw at. Unless you know there's fish out there, that, unless you know there's big chunk rock in the middle of the river, and that's what you, you, you want to target. You just don't want to throw them like you throw plastics. You have to have something to throw at and you'll be more successful, but you want to consider them situational. Like plastics are like 365. You can throw them all the time, but spinner bait, chatter bait. No. Yeah. Yes. We have a couple more questions online that we're going to get to again, guys, if you are watching online, please just type in your question and we'll try to get to it. Uh, the next question we have is from, Low Chops 301. Question from Jeff McGowan for Jeff Green. Do you feel that the profile of your baits are more important than the color of the baits you use on the upper tone? I do. Um, I feel like uh, profile is number one. And uh, first and foremost, that's what you have to have. A two or three quarter inch tube, I think would outfish a three inch tube any day. Uh, small mouth. Um, those uh, 
three inch Ned rigs. I mean, I'm sorry, two and three quarter inch Ned rigs. Uh, the profile means everything. So for instance, you can go out one day and catch a, um, catch fish on a Ned rig. And I think they think those Ned rigs sometimes are crawdads. Why? I don't know. I mean, they don't have pinchers or anything on them, but I think they think they're crawdads or they think they're those uh, stone cats, those mad toms, just, you know, kind of in the, on the bottom, just floating around a little bit, easy, easy to eat. But, uh, you can catch them on a Ned rig one day and you go out the next day and they won't even touch them and they prefer that tube profile. So yes, I, I believe the profiles first and foremost, the most important, uh, uh, you know, most important thing when it comes to catching the river smallmouth. Uh, also, if you're using a spinner bait, I guess you can consider it a profile kind of situation, but I, I know there's vibration involved. I've, I've fished um, spinner baits and chatter baits before. And one will catch fish and the other one will not. So sometimes they'll chase a chatterbait and refuse to hit a spinnerbait. And you throw literally I've thrown in the same hole and they'll they'll hit a chatterbait, but won't hit the spinnerbait. And I don't know if that's the uh, profile of the bait coming through the water, because they do have different profiles, but or if it's the uh, thumping of the or the vibration. But well, not understanding, you can only pick one 10 day period of the year to fish. <laughs> You got 10 days. Late March. Yeah, 10 days. When is when are you fishing? Jeff Lake's late March. And the only problem with late March is you don't know what the what the water level is going to be. Right. So yeah. my new favorite time to fish is December 1st, the 10th. It, it is the new fall. It's I say what you will about the climate change. You know, we get on debates. It just the water temperatures and the air temperatures seem to be better the last three or four years at the end of November, early December, than they were it used to be end of October, early, right. early November, right? That was the time to go. But I think right now, if I honestly, just because I, you rarely have terrible storms in December, right? You just, mm -hmm. we just don't, but March, I mean, you get all the ice melt from New York, it could be a lot of snow. March could be phenomenal or it could be an absolute blowout, right? So I would agree that I would prefer rising water temperatures over or, or lowering. Uh, if you could take that, if I knew that the conditions were the same, March definitely gets my vote. But I'm really become a fan of this December fishing. Early December. Yeah, I, I would say uh, that week when the water temperatures are on the rise in the winter time. So, uh, not necessarily a specific part of the month, but uh, you know, you give me some winter time temps where they're rising. <coughs> The reason why I say late March is um, for the past like three years, late March has been very consistent for me on the Potomac River. And when I say when I say late, I'm, I mean literally the last week of March. Um, so it, it's it's incredible. They just they come out of nowhere, and then um, and then it starts you know heading into spring, but late March. Yes, longer. Yeah, and they're big. A boat question. I don't know if it's Pods or no pods? Uh, you said pods or no pods for your boat. Yeah. Um, it all depends on the attitude of your boat. So if your boat, if you have an 18 foot boat and you're with a 9065 on it and it's relatively, gets on playing pretty quickly, there'd be no reason to add pods to it. None. Right? It's not going to really, the, the reason for adding pods is to expand your plating surface and to get you up and running faster right that's the main that's the main reason for the pods you know you can get a step pod for your dog because you duck hunt but that's a different reason that we're talking about. so yes yes but i don't again it's like anything else there could be a, a devil behind every situation right so if it's put on correctly and it's it's secure and the pods are not leaking water or weren't built to cause a boat to cavitate. I mean, it's the pods can be a good thing. Usually pods. So what ends up happening is we get a boat and we buy an engine that's at the top of our price range, outboard ones. And then we go, I, this boat's pretty slow. It takes forever to get on, on plane. I'm going to fix this with horsepower, which could work. And then you put that 200 horsepower engine on it that weighs 150 pounds more. And now you're so, uh, I can't use the word, so 
tail heavy on the boat that it can't get on plane. Pods will not, right? But you can't just go to pods are us and get them put on. I mean, you, you got to go someplace that knows what they're doing. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be another. It's going to be a bandaid over another disaster. So you know, there are guys who can do it, and there are guys who can't. Thomas. So I have a question. So have a question here from, here from myself. myself. Um, um, how is how the kayak, kayak tournament really pressuring, really pressuring Susquehanna, Susquehanna now, now, now that you have the Bass Masters, 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 they're coming, they're coming every, like single every single year. And year and the first, the first time, time you have a small mouth, mouth river that's under the same term as like title, title, Potomac. It sucks. It's just just Susquehanna or someplace else. Uh, we could do all three rivers depending on the pressure, but yeah, the Susquehanna is the one that I've noticed that has more pressure on it now than anything. Pressure else. changes everything, right? I mean, the more boats on the water, the more the more stuff on the water. Uh, generally, kayak fishing um, is not. I mean, it's the problem with kayak fishing is is that it gives people quicker access to some areas, right? So. If you have an area that's close to the boat ramp and they're having a tournament, you know, it it could be pressure. It takes forever to get in the water with your boat because there's more people, which would be the same thing of any tournament. Um, I think certain areas of the river that are more community based, uh, the kayak fishing has definitely impacted, you know, a little bit more pressure. I think the uh, COVID making everybody work from home and uh, allowing people to have a activity outdoors, which is a food activity by the governor of our state at least has added pressure. But again, these are all opportunities to go look for another place and get better at what you're doing. I have a question. Um, you guys talked about a lot of things, but you never brought up one, one thing about rattle traps. Um, what's your guys take on rattle traps? Uh, change the hooks out as soon as you buy a rattle trap. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't fish rattle traps because that's a bait where the fish becomes unbuttoned quickly. So a few fixes is I like to change my rattle traps out, and they're I don't know if they make them anymore. I bought a lifetime supply of these things called trapper hooks. They're really weird looking, but they really make a difference on you know if you're at fifty percent, you're going to go up to seventy five or eighty percent. The other thing, and these guys can add to it. I think you need a softer rod. You really need a slow tip rod for rattle traps. Um, they work great. And when you get the cadence down that the fish want, you're going to catch a bunch of fish. But until you find that cadence, it can be it can be really tough. And again, this comes into a turbidity thing. If you get dirty water on a rise, <laughs> rattle traps can make a lot of noise. You're going to catch a lot of fish. But you got to throw it into you got to throw it into cover. And so you've got to be willing to lose a few baits to do it. So I think that. The rattle trap doesn't get as much love as it probably should, um, but you know there was a time in my life where a black and blue or silver and blue rattle trap was just an absolute must-have on certain days. I think I fell more in love with the square bill crankbait and its control than a rattle trap over the years. But you're right; it's it's probably not used enough on my boat. Yeah, yeah. The the rattle trap again. That those hard baits. It's situational. There's, there's only one time that I ever use them with um, uh, customers on my boat, and that's when the water, uh, the uh, clarity of the water is bad, the tur uh, turbidity. Um, other than that, I, I don't really throw them very much. Springtime, you can get away with them even if the water just has good color to it. But um, uh, it really doesn't even matter. I guess the brand, I like Lucky Craft, and I like uh, the KBD ones, the Strike King ones. Just to add to what... Chris just said. I mean, that's about the only times I use one. Yeah, another question here. It's from Larry. Which river is going to give up a 23 pound sack first, the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac? Yeah, Jeff said it right, though. I mean, the Shenandoah is a tributary to the uh, uh, Potomac, but the same fish. I mean, I could, I mean, I could definitely see Shenandoah. You will know. Yeah, especially where the uh, Shenandoah meets the uh, Potomac, but um, there's a lot of big fish in the Upper Potomac River, a lot of big ones. So um, I would have to say the Potomac. Ooh, fight. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping back to where we talked winter, talk summer. Summertime, warm temps, everybody's out going, doing top water. What would, again, I want to get with your – your top three, if you want to throw a top water when they're really, they're on, 
their feet and you got good river conditions. You're going soft plastic, you're going, you know, uh, uh, whopper plopper. What, what have you found in these recent years for a top water? There's so much stuff out there now, hard bait compared to soft plastic. What have you found that's just been you know, doing it? Me, me personally, on the Shenandoah, the Potomac, uh, I, whopper plopper, of course. You know, uh, I introduced a friend who had never used them. His tackle box has 200 watts. He's yeah. every other lure he stopped. He just throws a whopper. <laughs> <whopper, laughs> <whopper, laughs> I was like, I, I didn't mean him to go that far. <laughs> he's like, there's no other lure on earth to him. And it was like, oh my God, he created a monster. Yeah. It works. But yes. he was like, yeah. he drank the cooler. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> lots of lots of fish. Have. But I mean, also, you know, Zara Spook, Tiny Torpedo. I mean, man, all both of those have really good soft plastic wise. What would soft you? plastic wise? I don't do a whole lot of soft plastic, uh, you know, top water baits. I mean, I have before in the past, but uh, you know, I'm not thrown into into weeds and stuff like that. So you know, generally the treble hooks, you know, aren't aren't an issue out where I'm at. Just, just touching base on the whopper plopper. What makes that bait so good? is that you don't have to have the rod control that you do on a walk a dog type bait. Um, it's very similar to a buzz bait, but you don't have to have the rod, the real speed to keep the buzz bait in a plane. And you can keep it in the plane longer. So I think that's why the love affair with this crazy bait is, right? I mean, I, I'm telling you that this year during that big white fly hatch, they make, it, what's the small one? Is it a 60? Six is the smallest one. I yeah. had to change the hooks on the back of it. Yeah, whatever the smallest one is. I had to change the hooks on the back of it. But oh my gosh, it was that thing was just stupid good, right? And big fish on that stupid little bait. Um, I like to throw a fluke or, or whoever makes whatever one you want to throw. And and believe me, I mean I've you can fish that on the top order. I nose hook it and I just tell people rip it. Bang, 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 and then stop it. So now it becomes a top water that goes to subsurface, right? Just under the surface of the water. But um, that's a, a very underutilized bait. If I'm fishing for largemouth in the lake, I use an offset hook and I, I Texas rig it. If I'm fishing for smallmouth, I nose rig it. Now, on a like a number one or number two uh, hook, short shank, short shank, just like you do almost for a. Uh Drop shot. Drop shot hook. That's exactly, exactly. right. Exactly. So yeah. you're throwing it with a drop shot style hook. Yeah, Gamagatsu, yeah. short shank. Really? Yeah. And that's, to me, I can walk that bait. And this year, even in, in the summer when I was catching smaller fish, I could use a five, a six, or seven inch bait, and it was working really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, it's crazy good. And on the big river, the, the, you know, down in the main river, you throw that out sometimes in like a foot of water. Where else? What else are you gonna throw other than a top water bait in that water? That's getting and you'll, water level and you'll move it, and you'll see two sets of these coming at the bait, and you just just hoping that one of them get to it before you lose your mind. <laughs> so it's it can be very very exciting. And I'll tell you what I used to do with with it is I would take because it was so hard to work the zero spook for some people is I would take the zero spook and I would twist the hook so I had the weight of the hooks on there. But I twist them all up so they wouldn't catch the fish, and I would tease up almost like I would if I was tuna fishing, tease up or like or bill fishing, tease up the bass, and then have them throw the soft fluke behind me Follow. and and you know act as if it, they've just dispersed a thing. And I've I've gotten more people on my boat into fishing the soft plastic after I tease them up, and then once I start it, they get confidence that they they start throwing it right. But that's a great little top water now. I think Z-Man makes a little popper yeah. that's pop, phenomenal. Yeah. And that thing can be absolutely incredible. But talk to your bait shop and get the right hooks. Because the wrong hook is just a fluster. Because you get the wrong hook on it, the, the bass hits it, you get it, and it comes flying out of their mouth. It just frustrates you. But if you get the right hook. All right. We have another question here from Low Chops 301 for Jeff Green. Who would you recommend someone take their boat to if it had damage? So if they're talking about a hole in your aluminum boat and you live over by me, Mount Airy, Maryland or Frederick, Maryland or um, somewhere in between there, um, I would take it to a place called McGowan, McGowan's um, uh, Welding. He, uh, he, he'll do it right at his house. He's a fabricator and that's what he does for a living he's just not doing it on the side so 
To answer your question, you take it to a place called McGowan's Welding. If anyone has a hole in their boat right now, anyone? <laughs> uh, and also to add to that top water, if you guys see a black um, whopper plopper in a tree below White's Ferry, it's mine. <laughs> I'm waiting for the water to come up high enough so I can be the only idiot out there that goes and gets it. The water's going to have to come up around 10 feet for me to get it. But I think I can reach it with my 12 foot pole. That has a little decorating for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> someone threw it in there and I watched him throw it overhead with a tree right in front of him. I was like, oh my gosh. And I couldn't get it out. So if you see it, just leave it for me. I'll get it sometime this uh, in the new year. Right here. Questions for uh, Travis. Is there anything different as you're doing? Yeah, so the question is uh, walleye on the Shenandoah, and uh, I've been pulling in some monster walleyes. Uh, honestly, man, I, I'm not, I'm fishing for smallmouth. Yeah, I'm targeting smallmouth, but the walleye just, you know, seem to want to eat. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, the majority of those fish, <clears throat> excuse me, coming in on jerk baits. They like those jerk baits, man. I like to see them move. So, uh, and you know, they're, you know, there's, there's getting to be more and more of them. Um, and I had, uh, did an episode with Thomas of fishing the DMV. Yeah. There's a monster right there. <laughs> Jeff Kelby. That was, in the background. That's exactly who's in the background. And, uh, yeah, that one was 29, uh, oh, like 29 gosh. and a half, 10 and a half pounds. <laughs> You know, so monster walleye, uh, but uh, you know they they like those jerk baits, and uh, you know they you just you know like I said, I'm just out there you know smallmouth fishing, so they just happen to have. Happen. But Thomas had asked me at the last last time I did an episode with him for fishing the DNB about if I thought that I could maybe start doing like you know dedicated walleye trips. And it's the more and more ever since he said that, I've, I've been like, oh, yeah, you know, it's starting to seem like that. Yeah, you got to work a little bit harder for the ones out here on the river, so, I think. So, Travis, do you notice, because we, we get them, we get them, we, we notice that they're on the currency. So, if we're fishing for bass and we find 20, 25, 26 inch, there's usually more than one of them in that same area. And you can almost go back to that same area day after day once this time of year gets into it. So yeah, yeah, and they definitely are school. They're home. Yeah, they are very they they are very school. Definitely. Um, you know, there was a day on the Shenandoah where we pulled out cookie cutter shape. Uh, you know, like maybe eight to twelve inch walleye, and I mean we probably put fifteen of them in the boat just in this one deep hole that we were in. So, uh, but yeah, great question, Thomas. Oh. Right here, we're all caught up. All right, good. Way else here. Right here. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard that of you mentioned a Senko, which is my favorite bait. Uh, Senko's? Can't go wrong with them, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah, Senko's a great bait. Uh, situations for the Senko? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I fish a Senko just like I fish a, a, a Ned Rig. So, you know, on the bottom, you know, just bounce it. Uh, you just got to buy more packs of Cinco's than you do uh, <laughs> the Zenith stuff. So. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah um, one of my favorite baits to use is a three inch Cinco. I know some people probably think uh, they don't like using it for some reason, but a three inch Cinco and a four inch, it depends on, uh, you know, the how you're fishing or, you know, when you're fishing. The skinnier one? still the same size the same just size. just the same ones like that uh uh those yamamoto ones you know um but yeah and, and the two colors i like the most are green pumpkin and black and uh they're just they should be outlawed they're, they're so deadly on the river you know but um yeah I, I use them with a uh slider head you guys ever heard of a charlie brewer slider head a 16th ounce um weight on them and um they just seem to crush them in the summertime I mean, I've, I've even hooked, uh, uh, on guided trips, we've hooked big musky. We never get them in. Of course, they take my little bait, but 
they'll grab one of those little Cinco's. Those Cinco, they just can't handle it. They see them and they just want to eat them. Um, how much is food where they're going to be in the winter, or is it just where they're going to be this warm water? Or is the food in the warm water? I mean, the food is in the warm water. What is it? The uh, uh, lots of crayfish. Crayfish and uh, you know, even some bait fish. You know, the water's not too cold. It's, you know, killed a bunch of them off. Uh, I was out on the Shenandoah the other day uh, in an area that I was just doing, uh, put in at one boat ramp and I was taken out of the same boat ramp. I have a 14 foot whitewater raft that I rode. It wasn't rowing back upstream, but I do have a small outboard that I put on it. And uh, heading back upstream, uh, I broke a shear pin, which is, you know, that's what happens in low water, you know? So, uh, broke the shear pin, pulled over, you know, walked back to my truck and uh, walking past an island and, you know, over the island and the water behind the island was full of bait fish. And, uh, you know, it's just pre it pretty interesting to see, I mean, like literally like thousands of these small bait fish back there. So. So, 50s and 60s, early 70s, there was a gentleman called Dan Gapin. He fished the upper, pretty much the upper Mississippi River. And Dan was on it. I mean, this is pre internet. His take on it was that a lot of these minnows are cold water fish. So, they're active, very active when it's really cold. I mean, Anybody ever throw ice in a bait bucket to keep their right their stuff a lot alive, right? You're, 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 you're taking water temperature summertime and, and dropping it down to the 40 degree range. And those minnows are like hopped up when you take them out of there, right? They're not sleepy, they're not anything. So I can't speak for all the rivers, but you've got dace, you've got darters, you've got all kinds of the emerald shiners that are just flourishing this time of year. And they're not going to be in the pods that you'll see, you know, in the riffles, like you'll see them in the summertime, but they're going to be in schools. If you've got electronics, you'll see them on your schools. And a lot of them will just be right on the bottom, right? And they're not moving a lot, but they're, they're active. So that's why when you're working your net rig or your whatever, whatever your, your tube, and you pop that tube off the bottom, it, it isn't likely a crayfish that they're looking for, even though it's something like a crayfish. It could be a darter that's sitting on top of a rock that just... It sees, sees a fin move like this. The That's why they move they, less in the winter because the, uh, the minnows are moving less in the winter, probably too. Right? Yep, they're absolutely. Moving. But they're there. I mean, it, they're, it's like a crayfish is really hard. I mean, sometimes you ever catch fish, they have a lot of a lot of leaves on their mouth. Those are peas that, that are rooting around in that stuff for elder mites and crayfish because crayfish really don't go dormant. They don't they don't hibernate, but they go more of it to a dormant stage. But I mean, I've caught crayfish in 36, 37 degree water. And they're moving really slow. I mean, they're not—they're not darting away on them. But if they can root through the rocks or through the, the gravel or through the, the grass, if you ever bring a big mass of stuff in your boat, and you've got freshwater shrimp, and you've got crayfish stuck all in that stuff, and that's what they're doing sometimes. Thomas. Now we have had over fifty unique people watching the channel right now, and I think we have in total we've had over like one hundred and thirty when you count in here, and then also watching. So great turnout, everyone! Please smash that like button. We're almost to 40, uh, 40 likes, and then we have a new question. I gotta find the damn thing again. There it is. Um, Brandon Solis, color, sound, or smell? Which is more important? Oh man, I mean, yeah. Smell helps them hold on. Yeah, smell smell does help them hold on. I mean, all three of them are, are can be relatively important at, at different times of the year. Different you know, water levels are dirty. I'm going to throw a you know a black uh, you know something dark you know it's a tube or something along those lines. Uh, you know, yeah, they all really kind of. I, I think it's a, play it's, a, in hand. it's a great question, but it really becomes situational. I mean, if you're in the Susquehanna. And it's summertime and there's not a lot of boat traffic. I'm not so sure that you want a, a really heavy rattling bait going through the water at that point in time. You want to be more stealthy. I don't think that you need any kind of flavor or attraction at that point in time because they're going to hit it. They're going to hit it hard. Um, so the, the color, we talked about, like, it, it, I, I tend to go muted colors 
full of translucent colors, it, the clearer the water is. I mean, and then the darker the water is, I don't care what color it is, as long as I can't see through it. If I hold it up to a glass of light and I can't see through that thing, I don't care if it's pearl white, I'm throwing it because it's just, it's darker than what comes down. I mean, I prefer to throw black because it's just, in my head, it works out better, but that's the thing. I, I think that the colder the water, the advantage of a scent is that it keeps that fish on the bait longer or creates a second strike. That's what smallmouth are infamous about their second strike ability, right? So if you feel a strike, if you can avoid the fall, you lose that fish, drop that rod tip back down, let that bait fall, you'll tend, tend to get that strike again any time of year. But if you have scent on it, you're definitely going to get a strike again. Um, I just don't know that that, that smell, other, other than... You know, I don't think smell draws bass passing. I think it's that if they're close, really close, it makes a difference. But I don't think the smell is a big factor in most of the years. Your tackle box fell in the water. You're right next to Jake's. You got 15 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to throw that day? What What are you going to grab a handful of and throw? What time of the year? I, I, it doesn't spread, you know, each, each, each different time. But pick a time. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of the Ned Rig. Ned Rig, Ned Rig, Ned Rig, Ned Rig, you know, all year long. A tube, two and three quarter inch tube, probably green pumpkin with a um, eighth ounce jig head. And you can throw that 365 days a year. Just, just honestly, throw what you're confident, yeah. confident with. Yeah. I mean, if someone's on a boat doing two to three to one to you on something, you can throw it this one, right? But if you have confidence, I have guys that look, look at it, they'll look at a holistic and go, I am not bold. Right? They'll throw it two or three times, don't have confidence in it. They're never going to catch a fish, before, right? So they want to throw a smoke purple too, because the last time on the boat we caught a hundred fish in a smoke purple too. I put a smoke purple to the bottom. They're going to catch fish. And then I'll show them through their partner. Hey, he's catching on a peanut butter and jelly, you know, coolest thing. And then, then, then they'll start to go. But you, if you don't have confidence in something, like the gentleman asked me about throwing the, the rattle traps or throwing the, uh, sorry, the, the spinner baits and the, and, and the, uh, the chatter baits, you just throw them. Yeah. Throw them. I mean, and, and realize you, you just, just throw them in different situations. Um, you're, you're once once that light bulb moment happens for you, you'll be fine. But confidence, I think it was Jeff Little. Confidence is key. If you have confidence in something, it's it's almost guaranteed it's going to work. Yes, Tom. Yeah, I was just curious about the Potomac. Uh, like this <coughs> late winter, early spring, like damn four up to eighty one versus Brunswick corner rocks. You got your preference. So. Yeah, you can answer that too, right? You go ahead real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah real quick. Uh, so, uh, repeat that question again. Fishing, like say, damn four, eighty-one bridge mm -hmm. versus Brunswick in that area during late winter, early spring. Yes, yeah, so fishing out the Potomac, uh, late winter, early spring. Um, you know, I, as far as the Upper Potomac is concerned, I mean, I generally fish that Harpers Ferry area. And uh, it offers a lot. Uh, and there's different parts of it at different times of the year that are going to be better, you know, especially like March and, uh, you know, late, late winter into early spring. Uh, you know, there's other parts of it that it's just not going to hold any fish. And, uh, you know, over, over time, you, you just learn where those fish are going to be that, at that time of the year. Uh, but, you know, you're in that transition period where they're going to start you know, spawns right around a corner if it hasn't already started. Um, but. Yeah. So the, uh, the use of the area above 81? Uh, uh, yeah, that area. I, I normally don't fish up there, but you said something about Brunswick? Yeah, I remember Brunswick. Yeah, um, those areas I fished. I, I, I know the river really well from, you guys know where Riley's Lock is, Seneca? You ever been there? All the way up to uh, Dam Four, and I, that's got to be like forty miles of river, right? And um, so you know that that uh, Harper's Ferry area. Obviously, I don't go in because it's uh, it's it needs a raft, so I don't I don't go through there. But skip that, and then go up into the areas where you can boat. Shepherdstown, right across the ri river is Sharpsburg, and then on up further. Um, yeah, you can't go wrong with uh, Knoxville Falls. 
You know where that area is? Um, just north of Brunswick. Uh, the Point of Rocks area can be good. Uh, north of uh, Point of Rocks that time of year. I find a lot of success around Brunswick uh, using late, you said uh, March? Yeah, I find uh, a lot of success with uh, with jerk baits. Yeah, we have one question. Right. You know, during the summer, the Bass <coughs> Magazine, they had a, it was an interesting article in regards towards the northern smallmouth versus the southern smallmouth. But I've noticed that at least on the Shenandoah, just how big their mouths can be. Are the genetics any different on the Susquehanna? I've never fished up there before in terms of like smallmouth. Is, is there any difference with the smallmouth up there at all? So my experience with the genetics, I really don't have a scientific reason for it because if you go back in time, all of these fish that were on the Susquehanna and the Delaware were literally from, you know, the Ohio basin, right? That's, that's where they came from. A uh, gentleman by the name of Thaddeus Norton brought these fish in those old fashioned, you know, 20 gallon uh, milk containers in a, in a refrigerated freight rail car. And he took them to Easton, uh, Easton, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania. And they, they, they stocked it. And within 10 years, it was 10 bass an hour, you know, on the fly run. So the commission got very excited about it and they said, we want you to stock these fish out of the Delaware and into the Susquehanna. And so 10 years later, they did the same thing and they flourished. If you go today and catch those fish, they look like they're completely impossible to be the same fish. On the Delaware, whether it's forage or flow, they have huge heads, very large tails, and they are long and skinny. On the Susquehanna, probably due to age, they are the same size smallmouth, has a much smaller head and a much smaller tail and a much wider body. So that could be forage, but I don't understand why the head is different unless these fish are literally multiple years old in the same size range. So you, it's, it's exactly the same strain of smallmouth, but they look completely different. And we're not even talking about enough time to be, to affect species and I mean, species takes thousands of years to, to change right? so if we're talking i mean that is to this in the 1800s right and then they did the, the susquehanna 10 years later so we're talking less than 150 years and they couldn't have possibly changed so flow and forage <laughs> plays a bigger role i think than south versus north so in the south they're going to grow faster they have a longer feeding session but we have more forage and they probably have a, a longer growth section. So they grow faster, generally in the south. And that's got to be it. On the Susquehanna, ask anybody that's ever looked over a rock. There's a crayfish under every rock. You go to the Delaware, you can flip, flip rock for four days before you find a crayfish. So their, their fish, their forage is generally, you know, minnows, faster moving stuff. The Delaware is a smaller flow um, from, a, if you look on a chart, when you see how small the Delaware is compared to the Susquehanna, the flow is actually higher. You know, it's it's a much faster moving rate. It falls. You know, if you look at the depth chart from uh, from uh, where it is, the bottom of the river, where it is from a geological standpoint, down to where it goes, it drops like eighteen to twenty something feet. Where the Susquehanna, being a lot older river, it may drop five feet in four hundred miles. It's just a very different. We have another five to ten minutes. Um, I'm jerk bait fishing. I have my I have an anchor out or my boat's on anchor with my trolling motor. And if I if the wind's blowing at all, I have one talon down. I want that boat to be as still as possible. Now I'll fish if I'm fishing in the middle of the river and I'm fishing, I will jockey the boat left or right or back. But when we're doing that, I usually don't have the baits in the water. When I'm fishing in, the, in this time of year. I'm generally pretty solidly slow when that water is below 40. I'm not, I want my clients to feel everything they're feeling that's in their control. I don't want any outside control with the boat moving at all. Just me personally. Yeah, you, you know, as far as my boat's concerned, um, being a raft, I actually have two anchors on my boat. And I drop a front one and a back one. And I drop, I'll drop both of them just to try and stay to the boat so that it's not. There's no sway to it, you know. If I, because a lot of times I'm I'm out maybe in a little bit more current, 
than what I'm fishing. And um, so, yeah, just, um, you know, keep it steady. <clears throat> so we're using a, a suspended jerk bait. That's what you're talking about, right? Um, yeah, you, you, your boat position is everything. Like how you have your boats sitting in the water. And uh, with the technology we have today with those uh, spot lock trolling motors um, in a boat, you can, um, like Chris said, you can move your boat left, right, up or down five feet, and, you know, whenever you want to. But um, yeah, you're going to want to, you're going to want to sit still. I mean, I, I've caught them just drifting real slow. I mean, obviously, yeah, you can catch them that way. You can catch them that way in the wintertime because I just had recently drifting in the middle of the river and catching them with a tube. Uh, like you're summer fishing, but just never moving the line much. But um, so when you throw it out, you're just going to pop it ever so slightly, and you're going to let the current take that that jerk bait and just sweep it all the way back behind the boat. You know, maybe pop it a little bit as it's getting ready to go behind the boat. I mean, there's people that'll fish with a, a suspending jerk bait in the winter time. You can throw it out, put it in a rod holder, and just let it suspend in the water, and uh, smallmouth will hit it too. That's what we call Rodney catching a fish. <laughs> so just just to be clear, because we talked about 40 degrees and under. If it's 40 degrees and under, you're really not searching the river for the fish. You're searching the hole for the fish. So if, whether you're fishing a, a above a, a, a ledge in between two ledges, you're just looking. You know that the fish are there. And so what I tell people is I like to look at the bubble lines a little bit to see kind of where it is to help us out. But if I'm if I'm the boat sitting exactly like this one, so it's all, the river's going to be going this direction. We're going to throw wide on a slack line and work the bait on a slack line for a while. And if we start hitting fish on a slack line, we're going to throw to the exact same spot. If it's, they're hitting it during the swing or at the bottom of the swing, I'm going to cut that level out and say, okay, guys, we're going to cut more like 30 degrees towards the towards the and literally have the bait hang behind the boat so you know when you're searching it's just easier to search from the, when the boat's in lock position in the winter time because if you find the fish in one area they're going to be in that area i mean you're going to pop four or five fish off that area maybe more so if once you find the fish you don't want your boat to move one iota so you say i'm i'm throwing towards that white barn you want to continue to throw towards that white barn until those fish stop biting there, and then you want to find the next one. So, you know, in a river system, you can't always throw on a slack line, but and that's a very different fishing than throwing on the on the current. You know, so when we're talking about putting in the rod holder, we're not fishing slack line baits. We're fishing, you know, we're fishing down river into the current sea away from the slack line. So, if that makes sense, if it doesn't. Feel free to stop by and I'll explain. That's important. Thomas has one, and then, sir, with the white hat, we'll finish with you. You'll be the last one. Yeah, and again, guys, thank you so much for uh, for watching. If you want to get your questions in, you better hurry up. We only have about 10 minutes left that we're going to be continuing the seminar. Uh, the next question that we have is Ned Rig or Tube? Ned Rig or Tube? If you had to pick one. Both. <laughs> that's what I'm going with. Both. That's my answer. Well, you can always fish a tube on a Ned Rig. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There is a CRT too. too. Uh, but, you know, I mean, they both, I mean, they're both just, I mean, they, they catch fish. Both of them will. Uh, I can't say which one I would, to be honest with you. The tube may have a little bit of an advantage when it's really, really cold out. Um, and they both catch fish like crazy, right? And uh, when, it, when I say Ned Rig, I'm talking more about the hook than I am the bait because I throw a stone caddy on the net rig. I throw, mm -hmm. you know, I throw a chili willy on a net rig. I throw Z-Man products out the wazoo on the net rig. So I think you have more versatility than you do with the two. But I mean, I'm not giving up my tubes. Um, I, I think um, with the history of the two, um, I would just just answer the question. I'd say a two, but. Does a Ned Rig catch fish? Yeah. yeah. Catches a lot of fish. Yeah, but fish yeah, big fish. But the but the tube is just uh tried and true. It's it's always uh since it's been invented, it's caught smallmouth bass. And it keeps fooling them every year. It's been around a long time and those fish are just too dumb to realize that that's not a something to eat. So it fools them every time. Hi, 
predominantly fish, front oil, the Arctic ferry. The questions for any of you gentlemen, but certainly Travis, I know that's your water. Um, I want to start targeting must, uh, must health fish that stretch of water for 25 years now. I'm sure I've lost a lot, had the line snap and not known it. <coughs> And I want to start adding that to my. What advice do you give a guy other than maybe drinking water? Lies on yours. Yeah, well, you, I mean, yeah, and you're talking about musky fishing. The question is musky fishing on the Shenandoah, uh, mostly main stem, but also some south, uh, south fork. Um, man, as far as where to concentrate on those guys, deep water, you start looking at stuff and you, and, on the Shenandoah, you start looking at it, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is a musky hole. Uh, deep water with log, log jams, you know, log falls, man. Those fish will hang out right there. And uh, definitely, you know, you know, wear some polarized sunglasses so you can see past the, the glare of the water. And sometimes you'll, you'll see them follow your bait in. Just not quite really, you know, willing to commit uh on it which you know of course is when you end up going into that you know figure eight style um and uh yeah but yeah definitely winter's great oh winter's great time for it man yeah yeah six or seven inch glide bait six or seven inch glide bait six or seven inch glide bait is what he said Oh yeah, yeah, you're, big, you're big rod, heavy line. I mean, it's you know you're gonna and, and, down and bring it or, uh, yeah, like like thirty pound, twenty twenty pounds, something yeah. like that. I mean, but also uh, you know you know you want to um, you know you can't give up. I mean, uh, that's the thing. You know, if you want to target musky, target musky. You know, uh, some buddies of mine they're they're true musky hunters and. You know they'll catch you know on a you know big meps you know bucktail uh musky bait they'll catch a you know 20 inch small and they call it an incidental hmm. you know they're not really worried about it they they want to catch that musky and um you know you just gotta okay. stay on it you know hold it i would avoid trying to finesse them on bass tackle yeah if you they're 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 gonna give you everything they got and your best thing as a conservative you know smart fisherman is to have the right size tackle for what you're throwing in you your your hookup ratio won't be any better your landing ratio will be much better and that fish will live a lot longer than if you you can finesse musky you can certainly do it mm -hmm. it, it just it wears the snot out of them so it's i mean it, it really is it's going to be easier to throw that bigger stuff i mean I, there's a whole bunch of you get on these musky forums but you know, glide bait, you can still catch smallmouth on it, so your day won't be completely bad. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you hook them on a glide bait, you, you've got them pretty good. Thomas has one last question, and we're going to do the raffle. And these guys will probably stick around uh, for a little bit. What you got, Tom? So, yeah, we got a couple more questions here to wrap this thing up. And then, again, we're going to be giving away the uh, fishing guide trip and then also doing the raffle for all the people to ask super chat questions. Uh, we have Chuck Arkale. Best spots for kayak fishing trips on the Shenandoah River. You know, the best thing to do is to consult uh, Google Maps. All right, most of the boat ramps are on Google Maps, and uh, don't do something crazy. And Thomas can uh, can confirm this. Don't do something I crazy can, can. and float from Route Fifty down to Route Seven because it's going to be a <laughs> all day uh, trip. <laughs> Uh, but you know, you know, start you know, start out with something short, and uh, you know, a shorter stretch. You can you can run that for a while and really get the good work over, uh, and you're not having to like stay on the stay on the time uh, game. So. So I really hope that you guys liked all that, like that uh, fantastic seminar that we just put on a uh, little housewarming stuff for, for our side of things. We have two winners from our super chat giveaway, which basically only matters for the people that aren't here. So if your names are, we got whooping bass and we got Sam Egerton, whooping bass, Sam Egerton. You guys have just won a house door. Well, come on over here. You say it. 
They have weird ass names. It's, have... it's a whoop bass. Oh. Like like whoop ass, but it's whoop bass. Should have been should have been, should have been whooping. <laughs> the second one is Sam Edgen or Edgen. I'm not sure how to guy pronounce whose it. Name was but Joe it's Joe not Edinger or whatever. <laughs> whatever you were saying. So so whoop bass and Sam Eden, you guys have won a door prize. Uh, if you are here in location, just meet up with me. If not, please message me on Instagram or Facebook to claim your prize, and I can mail it to you. Okay. Thank you guys so much, and like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.